Hello, this is Javin D'Souza. Uh, welcome everyone to the Symposium on Disability Cultural Centers in Higher Education. We are back together for a roundtable uh, uh, of Disability Cultural Center workers, uh, reflecting on how they approach the question, why disability culture? All right, so we will start by having each of our roundtable members introduce themselves in the order of Diane, then Anne. Great, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I have text in multiple places for my own accessibility needs, so sometimes I'll be moving my gaze away from this camera toward another camera. So I just wanted to say good afternoon, and I'm honored and thrilled to be here. Thank you for inviting me and including me. I'm Diane Weiner. My pronouns are she, her, hers, or they, them, theirs. My best pronoun though is really Diane. I'm a genderqueer, middle-aged, white Ashkenazi Jewish person. I identify as neuroqueer, mad, and crip. And I'm an individual with salt and pepper buzz cut situation here and green frame glasses. I'm wearing a light blue t-shirt with a logo of a jar, or maybe I'll pull it up. It's a, it might be a pill bottle. It depends whom you ask. Uh, the t-shirt is from the 40th anniversary of the Center on Human Policy at Syracuse University, which was in November of 2011. And that famous uh, logo features uh, the words label jars, dot, 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 not people in a lowercase black sans serif font. I'm also wearing a dragonfly pendant that belonged to my beloved Aunt Joan, who was my hero and remains so. And I'm joining you today in respectful, accountable and shared stewardship as I live on the unceded lands of the Cayuga and Onondaga nations in Awaga, sometimes called Owego, New York. I'm seated in front of a maroon wall with brightly colored various kinds and styles of artwork created by local and global artists, including members of my friendship circle and family members. I served as the founding director of Syracuse University's Disability Cultural Center from October 2011 until December of 2018. And I remain the lead editor of the journal Word Gathering a journal of disability poetry and literature housed at SU. Thanks again. Diane, now we'll go to Anne for her introduction. Hello everyone. This is Anne Y.E. Kwong. She, her pronouns. And before I go on, I just wanted to take a moment to share that similar to Diane, I am privileged and thrilled to have the opportunity to be in space and community with you all today. Um, in addition, there is a screen share of a I affectionately call cover page slide, um, which has my full name as well as some um, additional screen captures that are mostly for decorative purposes of the Disability Cultural Community Center webpage for UC Berkeley, as well as a portion of a petition letter that our student advocates submitted to create the center. And so I'm going to go on with my full description and intro. Again, as I've shared, my name is Ann Y. Yi Kwong. I'm currently the coordinator of the Disability Cultural Community Center at UC Berkeley. An image description of myself, I am an Asian American woman in my early 30s currently have a colorful floral hair ribbon in my hair, wearing a navy polka dot dress with a black blazer and sporting a jade green color necklace. Behind me is a wall with several images, uh, one of a la mountainous landscape of cherry blossoms, one of a colorful sunset or rise, depending on your interpretation, and a cup of coffee slash some desserts on the top because those are some of my favorite things to do, uh, sample desserts. 
I also would like to offer land acknowledgement as I am joining from the Berkeley area. We recognize that UC Berkeley and the Disability Cultural Community Center sits on the <clears throat> territory of the Huchin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people. The successor of the sovereign Verona band of the Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Mawekma, Ohlone tribe, and other familial descendants of the Verona band. We recognize that every member of the UC Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the youth occupation of this land. And this is my introduction. Thank you so much, Anne. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen now. Back to gallery. And so thank you both for your introductions. Grateful to have you here and for our first non-keynote speaker session. And uh, the question that we're, that's bringing us here today is why disability culture? How do we talk about the value and the need for disability culture and the work that disability cultural centers do? Um, so we'll start with Diane uh, for some time and then we'll have Anne and then we'll have a little conversation. Thank you. And for Diane, oh, sorry. No, go right ahead, uh, my bad. For, for Diane's portion, I'll be sharing my screen and providing uh, and sh showing some links that Diane has provided us. And Diane has also provided these generously in the chat if you'd like to access those as well. Thank you Thank very you much, there. Javin. So I wrote a note here that says thanks to Margaret Javin and everyone involved in making this space possible. And I wrote, wow, thanks so much, Sandy. Um, Sandy's someone uh, I hold in very highest esteem, as I do everyone here. Uh, and Sandy mentioned um, Petra Kupper's recent publication, Echo Soma, which will actually will have a review of that in the new issue of Word Gathering. Echo Soma is available in open access. Um, I put the link to that here in case anyone might be interested in, in accessing it that way. And I noted here that Sandy mentioned this great book in their opening comments today. And then I wrote um, links that, uh, well, the chat just disappeared on me, but I know what I wrote, so it's okay. Links uh, that I'm gonna share as, as um, Javin mentioned will be, will be um, coming up now. And so the first one of the five um, is, is I think important for, for contextualizing my understanding of the importance of disability culture, which is a conversation that often arises about language and the complexities of language. And this is a language guide that was created a number of years ago and updated several times. Before I continue, I wanna ask how my pacing and volume are for folks. And if there are any concerns I can adapt as needed, of course. Um, so if anyone has any concerns, you can let Javin know or let me know, or you can send a note in the chat or use the raise hand function or whatever means work for you to express that. So um, the language guide was produced by the Disability Cultural Center team at the university, at Syracuse University a number of times. Uh, and the guide is intended to, to debunk the idea that there's one way to talk about disability, that there, there's a, a clear and, uh, you know, un, uh, unthwarted way to talk about um, the complexities of what some people call etiquette. Um, and I think that it's an important resource that I'm glad to have helped bring to the world, but I really want to credit uh, Alex Umstead, who was the first graduate assistant at the Disability Cultural Center at SU. And I also want to thank uh, Priya Penner, um, who worked with uh, me on the revision of this and deserves enormous uh, accolades and the most, most credit, uh, she and, uh, and Alex, or I should say Priya and Alex. Um, so the next thing I wanted to mention is a story very briefly, which is that a number of years ago when I first became director, Wendy Harbour knows this story, a number of people started asking me if I was autistic 
And this had never happened to me in my life. And it was before I was familiar with the concept of neuroqueerness, which is an identity I now uh, hold and, and feel very grateful to understand as something I can claim in my life uh, with respect and open-heartedness. At the time, uh, that wasn't really a term that was being discussed widely in the disability justice and disability rights movements separately and together. And one of the things that came up is that Dean and Liat and I were talking, um, and then Dean, you know, obviously one of the uh, leads here at UIC said to me, they were, you know, intrigued as I was by the number of people who kept asking me that question. And so Dean said, I think it's okay to publicly share this. Uh, and if it's not too late, I'm going to do it. I think it's a, a good story to share. And I've thanked Dean for many years for this. Um, Dean said, well, it's a compliment. I said, you know what? That is not only so true. I think we need to make like an infographic about this, an accessible infographic. And at the time when people said they wanted something to go viral, it didn't have the um, problematic implications it has now, right? In the context of a global health emergency that's di disproportionately undermining and disrupting and harming and killing um, people of color and trans and, and queer disabled people significantly among them. I guess I should do content warnings before saying these things. Um, but anyway, Alex Umson and I created an infographic that said, no, I'm not autistic, but thanks for the compliment. And so that to me is one of the reasons why it's important to have a disability cultural center. And here's the inevitable motorcycle noise in the background. Sometime there might be a train and that will please Margaret. Um, so I think it's important to now briefly go to a broader guide that I think is uh, more widely understood um, in the disability justice and disability rights movement, and that is the Access is Love Guide from the Disability Intersectionality Summit hosted by the Pong, Paul Longmore Institute. I think if people want to understand the importance of a global movement around disability justice, disability rights, and disability culture, not just at universities, but everywhere, this is one of the ways forward. Uh, the Access is Love um, site, as indicated here, has an image description of a graphic with black text that reads, Access is Love with a red heart as the O in love. And there are actions and resources and readings and all kinds of materials. And this movement was started in many respects by Alice Wong, Mia Mingus, and Sandy Ho. And I just want to give um, enormous gratitude to them and support from this campaign benefits the Disability Visibility Project and the Intersectionality Summit, but it's really uh, deeply relevant to what does it mean to talk about disability culture. And the idea of a center is not just being located in a geographic uh, spot like a, a campus. And the hashtag access is love as mentioned here is created and led by Sandy Mia and Alice. And there's a photograph of them here with an image description of them under the photograph, which indicates um, three disabled Asian American women, Mia Mingus, Alice Wong, and Sandy Ho from left to right. And it describes what they're wearing and um, their uh, physical presence and presentation. In specific, Mia is wearing glasses with large hoop earrings. Alice is wearing a brightly colored scarf and an army camouflage print jacket. She is wearing a mask over her nose with a tube for her BiPAP machine. Sandy has wavy short hair and is wearing a black sweater. Behind them is a concrete wall with a door. Uh, the next link I wanted to tell a little bit more about in terms of the context in which we find ourselves uh, is very much in line with the important and powerful reflection shared by uh, Dr. Yi in, um, in Sandy's introduction. So this is, sorry, there's a motorcycle in the background again. Uh, 10 Principles of Disability Justice uh, from Sins Invalid, uh, you know, a collective of queer and trans, BIPOC disabled folks. Um, you can get a plain text PDF of this. You can get an updated, more in-depth explanation. There is uh, the primer or primer, I never know how to say that, of skin, tooth, and bone. The basis of movement is our people, um, which you can get in multiple formats. 
And I think that this is one of the most important contextual frameworks and activist approaches to thinking about disability culture, which didn't um, have the same prominence a few years ago as I'm very grateful it has now. And one of the reasons it didn't have the same prominence a number of years ago as it does now is obviously because of trenchant ableism, racism, and the intersectional elements of queer phobia, transphobia, and other forms of oppression. How's my pacing, Javin? I'll put you on the spot. All is well. Um, I can a lot about eight more minutes and then we'll move on to Anne. Great. I can also pause if people are woefully hoping that uh, I will stop talking. Um, and the, <laughs> the next um, piece I wanted to highlight in terms of relationships across disability culture and how we talk about the names of disability and the capitalization of disability and the disability arts and literature and athletics and media and a million examples is the journal Word Gathering, which as I mentioned, I'm very honored to now be leading for a few years. And this is the description from wordgathering.com of the journal, which is now registered with the Library of Congress. It is a digital open access quarterly journal of disability poetry, literature, and the arts with two interconnected purposes. First, we're dedicated to providing an accessible venue for featuring the work of emerging and well-known writers and artists and other creatives with disabilities, disabled artists, writers, and creatives. Second, we seek to make available and expand a searchable core of this work for interested readers and other folks accessing content with and without disability identities who are committed to poetry, literature, and the arts across a variety of media. And I'd like to go back in particular to a piece that I'm very, very honored to have helped publish, which was written by Sandy, um, which is the next link in my um, sequence here. So Sandy's piece uh, called The Crip Couture Manifesto is actually read by me. I'm very honored to have had the privilege of doing that. And I um, strongly encourage people to access this uh, textually. Um, auditorily and whatever means work best and most conveniently and most applicably for everyone's access needs, because it is really a stellar piece of writing and um, reflection that um, was published uh, recently um, in one of our cohorts of the Disability Futures in the Arts series, which is curated by Kenny Fries, many of whom, uh, many of you here know, know Kenny, know of Kenny or both. And I just wanna scroll down to the second paragraph here. Um, and I wanna read a little bit of this because I think that this phrasing and framework are paradigms for the importance of disability cultural centers uh, everywhere in multiple forms. A disability art, and so I'm quoting here from Sandy Yee. A disability art and culture movement that aims to improve the quality of the human race through crip-led radical care work in making wearable art objects by, for, and with disabled people that can incorporate their full intersectional identities. As an art genre within the disability art movement, Crip Couture considers disabled people to be well-born, quote unquote, even though eugenicists have claimed otherwise. Crip Couture believes that our complex embodiment is the source of knowledge. Its art making practice explores and creates new meanings around disability. Crip Couture operates as an instigator for challenging ableism based practices in the arts and in social relationships through its critical production processes and aesthetic choices. Crip Couture is a trendsetter, a platform for providing concepts, language tools, and methods for an alternative, non-assimilationist way to create disability representations according to disability justice activist culture. If I could tattoo this on myself and have people access it in multiple formats, 
you know, I would have boundaries about this, right? I'd have a, a version of it that would be, you know, in a tactile font that I would extend from my body. So if I didn't want someone to hug me, they could have an access that copy that way. But in all seriousness, to me, this is one of the paradigms of understanding the importance of the disability cultural center and of disability cultural and the arts broadly. So I'll pause there with gratitude to Professor Sandy Yee and Dr. Sandy Yee. All righty. Thank you so much, Dan, for sharing all these amazing resources. Um, I definitely learned a lot um, from what you've shared and all these amazing links. And now we'll move on to Anne. So Anne, feel free to take it away. Hello everyone again, this is Anne and I couldn't agree more. I really appreciate Diane for all of the resources that you have so generously shared. I've also learned so much and that's one thing that I'm always just, I love how the disability community is always so generous and so willing to share information. As a newer staff in this space, um, I'll provide a little bit of context here. The UC Berkeley Disability Cultural Community Center is relatively new. We started about a year ago um, in the midst of the pandemic. And one thing when I first started in this position is I have my own, of course, um, perceptions of disability culture, but I would love to learn more and really dive deeper into the community. And from my interactions with folks in this space, everybody has just been so generous and caring. So I wanted to start off with that. I thank Diane for laying such a great foundation and providing background for how do we talk about disability, what's the language, and also why, and providing some kudos to some of the forebearers who have really championed and talked about disability history. So now I wanted to share a little bit about why disability. One thing and pushback perhaps I have started and have always known, um, society always believes from my own perspective that maybe disability is not the most predominant identity. And as uh, Dr. Sandy Yee have shared earlier, um, a lot of times disability is seen in such a negative and thought of and uh, perceived as such a negative thing. Why would anybody want to even talk about disability? Highlight that fact, bring to prominence that fact. And for a time, especially when I was younger, I also fell into that similar framing. Um, growing up in a Chinese American household, disability was seen as, quote, shame. Um, there is this concept called saving face, where pride and bringing positivity to the family name is important. And being somebody who is blind, there was lots of whispers about how that would be achieved. So why? Why should we talk about disability? Well, many of the folks in the disability space, of course, say that disability is part of the human condition, experience, and existence. If folks are continually existing in our planet and on Earth, we may acquire disabilities. Folks may be born with disabilities. People can join the community at any time. Disability does not discriminate in that sense. However, some folks want a more statistical and quantifiable reason, especially when trying to make the case why we need a disability cultural space on campus. So here are some basic stats for Berkeley to provide some context for you all. Approximately 30% of the UC Berkeley community, which includes campus staff, undergraduates, graduates, postdocs, and faculty, identify as having a disability. Yet, it was not really until this past year that there was a dedicated space for folks to gather 
for folks to connect and for folks to meet one another and to really empower each other in that shared experience and to talk about disability justice and disability intersectionality. In addition, because 30% is a pretty sizable population of the campus community, we wondered how can the university, which prides itself in this academic space of being a space to allow for self-exploration, to encourage academic excellence, shun such a sizable portion of the population? If disabled folks are constantly under the emotional burden of wondering, how can I meet my access needs or where can I get this book digitized? Or I need to figure out and spend extra time finding out accessible routes or identifying mental health care. There's so many other tasks and emotional burdens. How can folks really concentrate on retention or achieving, quote, academic excellence? If such a sizable population is shunned. And maybe the question should be reversed. Why not disability? Why not disability culture? I wanted to provide a little bit of a theoretical framework that really helped me understand personally in my own journey of disability, of how intersectionality and the disability justice movement can parallel and include and embrace my cultural identity as well. So in multicultural spaces and lots of conversations and academic classes I've taken in the past that talks about culture, ethnicity, and race, a common framework came to mind. And that's the Bronfenbrenner Ecological Systems Theory. 1974. This theory really talks about how the social environment or what others' perception and interactions and relationships we have with each other influences my own development and interactions with others. Relationships are bi-directional. Social factors determine many facets of life. My way of thinking, my way of being and moving through space, presenting the emotions that come with it, and how others perceive me as well as how I perceive others. And in these social roles, there's intersections that often come to mind as they can fluctuate and shift. So for me, I have always struggled with, there are some pretty harmful stereotypes that are associated with the um, Asian American community and my family have sometimes due to lack of knowledge of that information in their native language um, shared with me that I might've inadvertently perpetuated when I was young. Oh, I should be quiet and work hard and things will all pan out for me. Oh, the quote model minority myth but that contradicts a lot with what i have to do as a disabled person moving through space there are certain times when i have to push back have to advocate have to question and be curious about my own existence in this space whether it be through my intimate and personal interactions with other disabled and queer allies and folks that's the micro system that Bronfenbrenner mentions, meso systems between groups, reconciling the Asian American identity and group I have with my disabled community and family, and macro, some of the potentially policies in society, in government that questions why disability, to which I push back, why not disability? And lastly, to conclude, I wanted to share a portion of a letter that our student activists drafted 
and were used later and submitted as part of the petition to really push back and continue to push back of why not disability. So, <clears throat> give me a second as I pull up the letter. My technology decided to not function <laughs> at this current moment. Um, Okay, there we go. This letter was drafted by our student activists and it was, was later used as part of the proposal and it was submitted in January 23rd, 2018. And this letter was shared with permission from the activists. A cultural space on campus goes beyond basic compliance that DSP, the Disabled Students Program, provides and more adequately promotes equal opportunity. It would acknowledge disabled students as a strong sociocultural identity group as opposed to a constituency that needs, quote, fixing. Shame isolation and presumed incompetence loom over disabled students when the institution neglects to recognize their importance and place in our campus community. Consequently, it is important that the administration aligns with their main tenets of a diverse educational experience by investing in and elevating the disabled student community on campus. And with that, I gratefully conclude um, this part of my talk. Wow, thank you so much, Anne, for that. Um, very uh, incredible insights and bringing the voice of the students um, to the symposium as well. And um, I've also, in the past year, have read about Bronfen Brenner's ecological model. So it was very interesting to see how that addresses the question, why not disability, right? Um, so we do have about 21 minutes uh, in the remainder of the session. Margaret. Hey, Devin, this is Margaret speaking. Um, would you mind spelling the name of that um, the system that Anne mentioned? Or Anne, if you want to it. I'm curious if I, I tried to Google it and I did not succeed. <laughs> yes. it's, an, it's an interesting name. Uh, and do you happen to have the spelling on you or I can the name uh, well. Yes, if I, this is Anne speaking, if I copied it correctly, it should be B-R-O-N-F-E-N-B-R E-N-N-E-R, and I'd be happy to drop that in the chat as well. I actually was, this is Diane speaking, I was wondering if I could ask a question of everyone to the degree people might feel comfortable and um, then we could maybe have an exchange with any other comments or questions people might have. Is that okay? Yeah, okay? so we can have a, a brief conversation, and then we could probably reserve the last 10 minutes for Q&A. And I'm, I want to thank you for your wisdom and sharing. And one of the things that uh, resonates for me in multiple ways over the years and remains to, true today is, for me, the people who have primacy in these conversations in the context of colleges and universities and disability cultural centers being created is, of course, the students. And I think that I remember this, well, right, it doesn't matter how specific or precise, I guess, but uh, about 10 years ago, several different people and I were talking, um, many students, and we were having a really amazing conversation at the DCC at SU, and several people commented that in 10 years from now, which is now, <laughs> 10 years from then, sorry, this is like science fiction now, uh, the 10 years ago, people said that in the future, which is now, <laughs> that we would have these centers in multiple places uh, and that they would be developing and growing 
And um, now it's come true. Uh, and it's uh, a profound and meaningful thing uh, to, to bear witness, not just visually, of course, because I'm not oculocentric, uh, to bear witness in multiple ways to that coming to fruition. And one of the things I wanted to ask everyone is part of what we were asked to think about in preparation for this conversation. Um, you know, what, how do we talk about um, the connections that exist? So, and we, I think we both talked about why it's vital for people to understand the importance of disability culture. But I think this question of, let me see if I have it here. Is there an aspect of how you define or name disability culture that is tricky or that you're still thinking through? I think that's a really important question for people who don't have what some people would call buy-in. So when over the years, um, I've been privileged to be part of conversations with the nuts and bolts of how to set up a DCC from advocating with administrators to recruiting faculty to working with students, whether or not there's a disability studies program, et cetera, all these very nuts and bolts kinds of examples. This question is always in the middle of it. I think it's an important question. So is there an aspect of how to define your name or talk about disability culture that is tricky? And I think that's a really important thing to ask, even though these centers are now manifesting because of people's outstanding labor all over the place, including yours. And so I was wondering what people thought about that. I don't know if people are raising hands or I can't access that. Maybe Javin, you can assist if possible. Looks yes, like- so. Um... Mm -hmm. I was thinking that we were going to have a conversation with just the panelists for now and then bridge it out to Q&A, basically. Okay. Yeah. So, Anne, if you, not to put you on the spot, but if you have any responses. <laughs> um. <laughs> this is Anne speaking. Um, I think that's such an important question, Diane, and I feel like I myself is working through that, right? That's the million-dollar <clears throat> question for me is how do we succinctly talk about the value and importance of disability culture and the disability experience without um, really addressing that buy-in. And so far, I feel like there's multiple approaches depending on who the audience members are. Um, like most things, um, folks who really are more in the administrative side of things really are much more persuaded by numerical and quantifiable, from my own experience anyway, um, evidence, quote unquote. And for me being a new center, the challenge is that chicken or the egg question of how do I prove, first of all, why should I prove? Because you know we already know that disability is very, deeply ingrained in most and many folks lives whether you have a personal lived experience with disability or no folks who are um, so but there's always that pushback of well we only have a limited amount of resources we need some sort of research and maybe this is a call out to future researchers in the space um, that we need more data research to really bring into prominence and have that information to continue to push and discuss and share why disability culture, especially for folks in the administration who hold the resources. This is this is Diane again. I, I'm so grateful to what you for what you said and to you for what you said and how you said it. And um, I think it's an important question to keep asking and I think one of the ways that some folks um, find themselves in a quagmire, in a dilemma, is because it it seems like there is a, a need to prove, as you're describing, and that, um, you know, why should we have to prove ourselves? Why should we have to constantly um, plead and, and prove ourselves? And um, being uh, preemptive about that, I think, is sometimes a, an interesting strategy, even though I wish we didn't have to do it. And I can say, if anybody wanted to talk 
before, after, or during any of these upcoming sessions, um, you know, about any of the surveys that we did at the DCC at SU and how those were created and how they were distributed and the data we use that then help validate, um, I'm happy to do that. But but simultaneously, why should we have to? And, but that's the economic context in which we, of course, find ourselves oftentimes. So I think we have 13 minutes. I know I'm not really moderating this, but I'm multitasking and I'm also just trying to be helpful unless it's annoying. <laughs> All good, all good. Yeah, no, I mean, if, do, uh, shall we move to Q&A? Yeah, I think several people had their hands raised or, or you know, indicated questions or comments they might want to share that I perceived. Okay, perfect. So, let's see. So we have about, yeah, as you said, 13 minutes for Q&A. And so I'll cue Margaret to uh, open the chat so that people can post um, questions in the chat. You can also call, I will also call on people whose hands are up. Um, and yeah, so we can start with Q&A first. Let me find the participants list. Uh, we'll have screens going. Um, okay, the first, oh, hold on, let's see. I have two hands raised right now. So uh, I'll first call on uh, Kara M and parentheses you Mish. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Kara. I use your pronouns. Thank you, Diane and Anne, for, for sharing all you have um, this morning. My question for you, and thinking about Diane's, Diane's question uh, just a minute ago about defining disability cultural, disability culture rather, is the extent to which um, disability cultural center efforts kind of get folded under a DEI umbrella or a DEI project. Um, a project which I'm a little bit skeptical of, which importantly, you know, names the power of language and words, but ends there. And I'm just wondering, you know, how you think about these types of efforts, as well as sort of the ascendancy of DEI at universities, um, and what that means for our, our efforts in organizing these types of centers. Anne, would you like to respond? Um, first, second, or or not at all. I want to defer to you. I think being recognized and included, and this is Anne speaking against, is only the first step. Um, for me, I've noticed a lot of times, and before my work at the Disability Cultural Center at Berkeley, I worked in the uh, pre-employment transition of disabled youth space. So a lot of my interactions were with youth families as well as potential employers for summer opportunities for youth. And part of the issue is getting folks to even think about disability as part of the broader DEIB, disability um, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and J now adding justice into that acronym to even get that to be recognized, right? Um, but second of all, I feel like there needs to be action um, saying, oh, I acknowledge or let me now include a style guide and a language guide is a great first step. But knowing how to recognize someone and referring to them by their, their identity, doesn't really, in my perspective, do anything tangible. There needs to be a, a step two from that those efforts. So I think having the disability identity in conversation be more, quote, visible or acknowledged under the broader DEIBJ umbrella is a good start. Um, but then there needs to be follow up or follow through um, tangible actions. Um, one of the things that really resonated with me that our student, staff, and faculty advocates shared is the visibility of disability on campus. 
um, and recognizing that we exist is the first step, but also making sure that there are resources, spaces allocated, especially on a large campus like UC Berkeley. Space is such a limited resource that if we really want to make change and the administration really does care of the broader campus and they need to follow up with actions. I, this is Diane speaking. Thank you, Anne. I know that we have uh, limited time, so I'll try to be very brief. And I'm also noticing some comments in the chat as well. And so I, I think that um, one of the things is that I used to talk about this with per, the person who supervised me when I first began as the director at the DCC at, S, at Syracuse University, that people are coming from different places. And I don't want to use a developmental model because I think that's problematic, but some people, are, as we as we know, I think in various ways, approach a conversation about disability where they don't even understand that there are multiple models of disability. Some people approach the conversation, whether they're students or faculty or staff or allies or accomplices or community members or a combination, alumni, they have no idea what it means to talk about disability pride. Why would anybody be proud of having a disability? So how we talk about language and how we do actionable uh, things in, with respect to DEI is that accessibility broadly defined, including disability accessibilities, have to be part of every DEI conversation, I think. So having DEI disability uh, themed conversations or having diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, justice, never have accessibility be part of that interaction is not okay. So I think that students have to be part of all of those conversations and committees and meetings and foundational framework creations. Um, and I think that I know here that there's a comment from Wendy that says, Wendy Harbour, back in the 90s when I was a student on the board of the first DCC in Minnesota, otherwise known as the Disabled Students Cultural Center, the great Dr. Carol Gill at UIC supported that DCC's founding and her responses to our initial debates about this was, quote, if disability culture doesn't exist, then it should. So we use that um, as our rallying cry in response to these internal debates. And Brian Rush, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, noted, you mentioned buy-in for administration. What about buy-in for disabled students? How have you been able to get students to engage with the center and the university, which they might have had unsavory experiences with previous to the center's creation? How do you get students to believe in the cultural part of the disability as well? I think that's part of what Anne is talking about and part of what I'm attempting to respond to. And I think we're gonna talk about that throughout the conference. That's my sense. Um, so those are just some things I wanted to reflect on with appreciation. This is Margaret speaking, so we do have one um, comment that come privately through the chat, but we were thinking we would alternate raise hand function and chat, so why don't we hear another question from raise hand function and then I'm just letting everyone know that I am ready to read another chat question. Thank you, Margaret, for pointing that out. But yes, yeah, so I think just in general, some, uh, for the symposium, we'll alternate between chat and the raised hand function. So the next person I have on the list, and this may, we might have time for one more after this, but the next person on the raised hand function is Emily Rose Corin. Thank you so much. I Can you hear me? Thank you. I'm so uh, energized and inspired and grateful. Um, I uh, My question relates to um, the intersection of disability and ethno-racial identity, which is where most of my work is, specifically around support and relationships. And I'm just wondering, uh, most of the work I do is at Hispanic serving institutions. So working with Latinx students that are also disabled, however they identify students with disabilities, um, and uh, I guess I'm wondering, um, something that a lot of the students I've worked for is, worked with have said is, okay, you know, the, the HSIs, the Hispanic serving institutions are here to serve, explicitly serve Latinx students, but what about Latinx students with disabilities? They also talk about queer Latinx, all these intersections. And so my question is, what is the responsibility or the roles or imaginings or wonderings, if you have any, about how a DCC 
whether one that is exists already or doesn't might um, work with intentionally, you know, a uh, Latinx student organization, whether that's formal or informal, you know, to kind of, we talked about buy-in, to kind of gain that buy-in um, or really just support and create a space that's welcoming so that the DCCs, and I'm not saying they are, but that they don't become white disability spaces. Thank you so much. Anne, did you want to respond? Oh, like uh, sorry about that. I was just about to jump in. Jump in. Thank you, Diane. This is Anne speaking, and I really love that question and that uh, perspective you just shared and brought up. I think one thing that we are trying to do is really forge those partnerships with fellow cultural centers. Um, so, for instance, the DCC at Berkeley is neighbor to the Fannie Lou Black Student Resource Center. And we've actually been in conversation to plan events during October with our Gender Equity Resource Center. Students have expressed, for instance, we want to have conversations and events centered around both neurodivergent and LGBTQ identity. In addition, one of the events we held is called Affinity Spaces, designed for new students coming into the university. And one recurring topic that has come up that folks are really interested in learning about is ethno-racial identity and disability. So we had a few students who spent several hours on this um, in this conversation, which was only supposed to be 90 minutes, um, on really talking about because they identify as Asian American as well as disabled, they wanted to know how to really have the language and be empowered to talk about disability, um, not only in the disability space, but also in the Asian American spaces and communities to which they belong. So we're really trying to find those allyships with other cultural centers that are on campus to collaborate and co-sponsor events so that folks can feel like they're belonging to a, a space that's been co-creative, that they could bring more of them themselves and their authentic selves into that space. I want to briefly say thank you, Anne. This is Diane again. Um, I'm wondering if this session should have been three hours long. <laughs> but anyway, um, great conversation, everyone. I, I think um, that it's necessarily the, the case and must be underscored as the truth that disabled people hail from multiple, sorry about the motorcycle in the background again, lots of motorcyclists out today. I hope they're safe and no one uh, is being disrespectful to them. So there, there's an important and necessary underscoring all the time, I think, to helping people who may not be um, as aware about this as, as some of us might prefer or demand. Disabled people are already always often simultaneously hailing from multiple other identities. And so the idea that a disability cultural center is a white space or a cis space or a masculinist space or heteronormative or et cetera, any oppressive um, way one might imagine. One of the ways I think to avoid that is to begin by being collaborative from the get-go, as it were, with the women and gender studies spaces, uh, equity and gender equity spaces, the LGBTQ Resource Center, the um, Office of Multicultural Affairs, whatever the centers and uh, the uh, Chicana and Latinx and Hispanic cultural centers, whatever these different centers and, and units and spaces are within a campus on the so-called academic side in terms of programs and departments run by uh, faculty, staff, and students in companionship and in camaraderie and hopefully not with hierarchy, although, hey, but we're being recorded, so I'm being prudent in my remarks, although honest as always. And uh, come on, we all know that's bullshit. Of course, there's hierarchy. Look, now that's been recorded. Uh, and then we also, of course, have the spaces which are administrative units, as it were. Um, and so how do those partner with each other and collaborate with each other from, from the outset is one way, I think, to talk about all of this. That, that, it's, that the DCC still has to be a caucusing space, though. And this is something else I think someone was asking about 
um, which is, you know, I do think personally that a disability cultural center must be separate from an accommodations office. That is my opinion for what it's worth. And we can talk about that more later, I guess, but yeah. All righty, thank you both, uh, Anne and Diane. We really appreciate your participation um, in this session in the symposium. Thank you everyone for joining us and thank you to the access workers and to our panelists. Uh, we'll be taking a break until 2 p.m. Central, so it's in about 90 minutes or an hour and a half. Um, and then we'll come back to this Zoom for our first histories panel of the day. There's three histories panels. So the first one, well, where we'll learn about the first wave of disability cultural centers at the University of Minnesota, Twin Cities and Syracuse University. Um, so yeah, thank you all um, and enjoy your lunch if it's lunchtime or whatever you need to do. Uh, we'll see you in, back here in 90 minutes.